Hey guys, so today you and I are going to talk about bringing it all on up, moving up. So let's get into it. So the question in question was, Frederick, you mentioned in this video, and this video we're referring to, as a software developer, what is your greatest strength? Oh yeah, that's I remember this one. Uh, in this video, that you uh, you uh, you said that you went from being a regular developer to one who solves problems on a team level. I'm also in this stage right now, and I feel that this is what I need to do to continue to advance my skills and career. What advice could you give to people in this situation? Maybe some common mistakes that we need to avoid, useful communication and selling tips, etc. Thank you very much for your videos. No sweat. Uh, yeah, sure, I can give you some tips here. Uh, so basically the, the root of the question is uh, when you are at that stage in your career when you're moving from just being quote-unquote a regular developer to being a team lead or someone who is actually in a position of uh, slight influence at the very least where you, you're going to make team level decisions at the very least, what is good to think about? So. I will give you my tried and true methods for doing this. Uh, I can only, I mean, guys, there are so many books on this because it basically comes down to management. Uh, and the thing that I've found though is that it's sort of hard to find anything that I consider to be quality materials on management. Uh, maybe it's just me, but honestly, whenever I try to read like a generic book on management, sure, it's going to give you some basic ideas of how to do things, but I like to say that it's like reading a book for the mentally handicapped. It's like, for the most part, the, the things that are stated are so gosh darn obvious to anybody who isn't like... If you have like an average person's emotional intelligence, a lot of the stuff is going to be very obvious, but the the more intricate, really hard things to figure out usually requires a person that is smarter than the author of the book to actually do uh, or to, to communicate. So I, I can only give you what I've found because f frankly, it's like these tips have worked. They working for they work for me, but it might not work for you. It's up to you to figure because if, this is such a hard thing. It's such a dynamic thing. It's like asking how are you how how do I lead a company or something like that. Where sure I can give you some general advice. But at the end of the day, it's going to come down to you and how good you are uh, and how equipped you are to do any type of leadership. So let's get into it. Uh, when I start in a new team or when I've been when I get to be in charge of a new team, it's happened a few times. The first thing that you always need to do is to get the lay of the land. That's number one. You need to orientate yourself in your environment. And if you are a new manager, I urge you to understand two things about whatever you do. Number one, first thing is to figure out what is the state of everything. You, because when you are the boss, even if you're just like one level above everybody else, you are now going to be the go-to person for literally everything related to the people under you. That means that you, like it's like a pyramid. You are the top node now even if it's just you and one other person, whatever. You are now, you're responsible for the information that is underneath you and all the output, usually. And that is, for some people, and we're going to touch on number two as well, because that is very important to keep with you, because this is a lot of... I, I've seen this happen on, like, a, a, it's almost embarrassing that these people are the age that they are, who are people who are, like, in their 40s, who get just a slight hint of power. I usually see it in the young, younger, uh, like, the 20-somethings when this happens, but if you are an unfit boss you will start you will really need tip number two but start by doing that you orientate yourself get to know all the people that work with you all the all your stakeholders get them to a first name basis understand them talk to people that's like that's like 50 percent of what it is to be a good uh, team level decision maker or like a, even a company level if you're going to be any type of manager communication is everything and i'll touch on why that is as well and your priorities is your the ideal way of you at least what I've found to be the ideal way to set up a team structure that works and scales. So that's number one. Number two is find the sweet spot 
of involvement for you. What does that mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. Number one that happens when you are either an emotionally ill-equipped person to be a leader, you should not be a leader, in my opinion, if you, if you have one of these problems, or if you simply are way out of your depth and you don't even understand how people work, like you're simply so not sociable enough, or you, uh, you're too much of an introvert, or you have some type of letter combination that makes it very difficult for you to be a leader. If you, if you have these types of things, you will make one of these two, uh, one of these two extreme mistakes. On the one extreme, you are going to try to micromanage people. You have going, to, you're going to go in with the with the idea that I have a vision. I'm the boss. I think that we should do things in this and that way, and everything should work in this way and that way. And if you're not on board, fuck you, because I'm the boss. And you're going to try to be involved in everything. You're going to try because you feel ultimately responsible. And what you're doing there is basically, and I've seen this. Oh, at, at, it's uh, it's embarrassing to see people do this and at like a high high level where people are like they feel uh, managers who get emotionally invested and embarrassed and like they feel like if their department is performing poorly it's a reflection on them and they start pointing fingers and all this immature bullshit that doesn't help anybody they're acting like they're acting like they're trying to impress their fucking mother-in-law or something, and or like they're getting criticism for the, from their dad. Uh, so and so, in the response is that they get some criticism. They're not emotionally mature enough to handle that situation, so they start projecting out a bunch of problems and micromanaging all of their employees or all their team members. As a result, that's the one extreme. The other extreme is that you have a manager who is just not give a shit. They didn't get the memo that they are supposed to be in charge so they just continue working as if you know i'm still just a developer it's just that i get a bigger paycheck and i have to sit in on a few meetings but i don't do anything else they basically just yeah i have the title these are the two extremes if you can identify with any of these you need to bring it into the middle or quit please for everybody at that company you should not be a manager now I'll tell you how I usually deal with these, uh, like what, what I try to go for. I do something that I call a gateway process. I try to create a gateway, a gateway process. What that basically means is that, as I was saying for step number one, orientate yourself. Figure out who are all the stakeholders and then you gather up what are the values of these people. What, do, what, what is it that everybody cares about? And I like to make a list. I like to make a lot of lists for these sorts of things. First I like to say, okay, this is these are the must-haves. Things that we expect from everybody who's working at this in this team or everything from how do we deliver software how do we treat each other how do we do this that etc etc the values of the uh, of the people in there and then you have the nice to haves they're not as important as the, as the must haves but they should be considered and then you start creating gateways and what is a gateway a gateway is a rule or a process or something that ensures that these values are met an example uh, to to make this a technical thing but but you have to remember this doesn't have to be technical it can be like a, a physical process like a, or a social thing or like you have to post the message to slack or whatever it's just a rule stating something but in tech uh, we have so-called ci pipelines now what is a, a ci pipeline is literally well, that's a gateway system it's because when you push code and you try to get that to production you have gates that you have to pass you have to have passing unit tests passing integration tests, uh, pass uh, the QA team, pass the like the testing environment or the staging or whatever you're doing. Like you have this, this flow of things, of gates that you have to pass through. And you are free to do whatever you want on your laptop. You're free to write code in any way you w want, but as soon as you try to move it into the master branch, there are checks of quality and process and so forth to assure to, to, to assert that you have produced code at the quality level that we have all agreed upon. That is what I go for. Because that is a system that is scalable and it doesn't require me to micromanage anybody. And I think that is the best thing for you because you as a manager, you have to accept one very specific thing. And this is the transition that a few, very few managers know how to deal with. 
and that is that, as I was saying, you are perceived, and technically you are, uh, the person responsible for everything that is happening in your sphere of influence. That means that you will see that you will go from, if you're now a coder, you're going to go from coding almost all the time to almost never coding because you're in meetings and you're preparing work for other people and you're talking to stakeholders, you're planning up ne new work, etc. etc. And that's why communication is such an important part of being a manager because if you can only do one thing as a manager, it is to communicate with everybody because you are the spider in the web, you are the top node. If you are not making decisions or if you are not available, you are stopping other people from doing their job. And that's why you have to communicate to a point where it is almost all you do. If you are delayed on anything or if you have anything that happens in your life, you do not possess the luxury of just, you know, you know yeah, no, actually, I'll, I'll just, you know, not tell anybody. You have to literally, it's almost like... Uh, a logging system. Anything that happens to you, you have to perpetuate to other people because they are depending on you. They're not necessary, and it's fine for you to not have time to do everything, but the thing that you can never do is to go quiet or not respond to emails or not respond to people because you are the person blocking them. They're not blocking, usually, usually that is the case at the very least. And that's why you cannot create a delivery process that depends on you, or if, say, reviewing all the code or doing all that stuff, because you will not have time to do that stuff. So you need to create a system that I like to, this is not my quote, but it's the best damn explanation I've ever heard. You need to create a delivery process where the master branch protects itself from bad code that is what you're going for. So what I want you to take away from this is that it's almost impossible for me to give you all the th thoughts and things that I can tell you about managing, like going from a developer to a team lead or like to be in that sort of position. Uh, the short version is that number one, you have to understand that communication and being available and uh, understanding the ecosystem that you are in is your number one priority as a manager because when you are a dependency for other people, remember, you usually have to be involved in a lot of decisions and discussions. Well, you can't just shut down and sit and do your own thing. You have to talk to people all the time because without you, they are not able to make decisions or they are not able to get answers to their, to their questions. That is your primary function as a manager. Second thing is, make sure that you are not an extreme. Understand that it doesn't matter how your, your people are doing the work that they are doing as long as that meets the quality and delivery speed that is set by you and the other people, whoever makes that decision. So don't try to micromanage people, but don't try to, you know, don't let people just do whatever the hell they want. Create, in my opinion, a gateway system where you have quality checks and processes and so forth that assures that as long as you just let that system be, the work is going to continue, regardless of if you're there or not. You don't have to check in on everybody because the system protects itself from bad practices. This is easy to say, in, it's, a, it's a lot harder to do. But these are the two main tips that I can give you. And then lastly, remember, as a person who's going to make team level decisions, you have to understand that you are the, you, you are the spider in the web. That doesn't mean that you can just make any decision that you want. You just have to be available all the time and be involved in all possible conversations and have that one question that uh, in the back of your head at all times. And that question is, do I know the state of all the things I'm responsible of, who are responsible for? Because the, that's the, your main purpose to the people above you. They're going to ask you, when can we get this? When is it done? How are these things going? That is the, these are the questions that you have to have an answer to at all times. Have a great day.